Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, not long ago I did this video on the Coriolis effect and what you needed to know about it. Now in the Flat Earth community, there still seems to be a lot of confusion about how aircraft in flight deal with Coriolis factors. Now most of this confusion can be traced back to Brian Mullins, a Flat Earth engineer. And today we're going to go over his video and try and see if we can make some sense out of it. So let's cue up the music and get going. What I have here is a view of the Earth looking down on the North Pole, kind of like I was talking about in episode 1.1, looking down on the North Pole like this. What I have is Quito, Ecuador here, and Singapore over here. And so if you look at this on the globe right here, Quito is about is right here in Ecuador. We're going to say it's right at the equator. It's a little south. Okay. We're going to take a flight from Quito over the North Pole to Singapore over here by my thumb. Okay. Now, Singapore is at 104 degrees east of the prime meridian, and Quito is about 78 degrees west. But And so that's 182 degrees between, between them. But I'm showing a straight line here. We're just going to assume that they're 180 degrees away from each other. And the runway at Quito actually faces almost due north. So we can say that the pilot's going to start off and fly directly at the North Pole, okay? And so when a plane is sitting on the runway, it's moving with the Earth, right? If in the heliocentric model, the Earth is rotating about its axis, um, where we're all moving. I'm moving, you're moving, we're all moving at different speeds based on how far we are from the equator. Well, that's the way I figure it out at least. And so at the equator, I'm going to say here that the, the circumference is 25,000 miles. You can say it's a little bit less, but we're just going to keep it simple and say 25,000 miles. And we're going to say that the Earth makes one rotation in 24 hours. And we're also going to say, to keep things simple, that the flight from Quito to Singapore takes 24 hours. And we're also going to say that that distance is one half of the circumference of the sphere. We're assuming a perfect sphere here. Um, and so that's 12,500 miles. And if it takes 24 hours, that gives you an average flight speed of 521 miles per hour, which is very possible. And uh, flying 24 hours is also very possible. I looked it up, so the longest flight ever was for four days. They're probably refueled in the air. But a plane could be outfitted to fly from Quito to Singapore. So now, when the plane is sitting on the runway in Quito, facing north, you know, here on Quito, the Earth is rotating, right? And so, if the Earth makes one rotation in 24 hours, 25,000 miles circumference divided by 24 hours gives you a speed, an instantaneous velocity on the Earth of 1,042 at the equator. Excuse me, at the equator, gives you an instantaneous velocity of 1,042 miles per hour. Now you notice for the plane, I wrote speed instead of velocity, because in physics, speed is just a rate, whereas velocity is a rate and a direction, or having a vector. And I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute while I wrote speed there. So the plane is sitting in Quito, use a marker here to represent the plane, facing due north towards the North Pole and it takes off and leaves the runway. And as the plane begins to fly towards the North Pole, well, the speed of the Earth below the plane would change, right? Because since velocity is distance divided by time, or speed is distance divided by time, whatever you want to look at it, the circumference of the Earth around the axis of rotation decreases as you fly north, right? because the Earth is curved. And so I just did this by drawing it in CAD. 
when the plane gets to New York City or, or you know, at the same uh, latitude as New York City around there, the speed of the Earth has dropped to 800 miles per hour. But the plane should still be moving at VE, the velocity at the equator, with 1,042 miles per hour, right? Because on the runway, it was moving 1,042 miles per hour. What slowed it down? That's his movie. If, the, if you go back to episode 1.1, 1 .1, uh, I, I was asking the question, how does the atmosphere spin perfectly with the Earth? Let's say it does. If that's true, does it create a suction force on the plane to slow it down? How does the plane match the speed of the Earth? How would it, how would it stay in a straight line? Would the pilot have to be constantly turning to the left a little bit to stay pointed at the North Pole since the Earth is slowing down under it? You see, when you get up here to 68.5 degrees north, the speed actually reduces to 400 miles per hour. How would this work? All right, so let's go ahead and go over this little problem. This is a very interesting problem if you're a first-year physics student in high school. Uh, for a graduate engineer, this should be no issue at all. Apparently, Brian is struggling with it, so we'll help him out a little bit. So let's go over a couple of things. The airport runway actually has no bearing whatsoever on this problem because an airplane can fly circles on the equator with no problem at all. What is important is the fact that the rotational speed of the Earth at that location is 1,038 miles per hour. No problem with that at all. So you're going to take off from Kento and you're going to start heading north. And by the time you get up here to New York at 40 degrees north latitude, you're going to have to somehow match the rotation of the Earth at 800 miles per hour. So you're going to have to somehow do something with 200 miles an hour of excess speed. Now here's the problem I think that Brian has a, an issue with and what he's not looking at when he tries to solve this problem. In order to fly from the equator to New York City at 40 degrees north latitude at 521 miles per hour, it's going to take you approximately 5 hours and 20 minutes to make that trip or that north-south transition. And then what we'll do is we'll see how the adjustments for the different rotational speeds of the Earth are made. So let's go over to the whiteboard and have a quick look. Now this is where vector addition comes in handy. Let's take an example as a flight from Anchorage, Alaska to Juneau, Alaska. How far south do you have to go from Anchorage to get to Juneau? Well, you have to go that far south, right? And then once you're that far south, do you have to go east to get to Juneau? Well, yes you need to go east. So, we have two vectors to our flight. We have a north-south vector, and then we have a west-to-east vector. The end result is this vector right here, which is the direct route from Anchorage down to Juneau. Now, in order to understand what's going on here, we need to have a look at the aircraft in Anchorage. So, let's say The airplane is sitting on the ground right here in Anchorage, and its speed is 521 miles per hour, which is the speed of the rotation of the Earth at 60 degrees north latitude. So, if it's sitting on the runway there in Anchorage, how fast is it going? It's going 521 miles per hour. How fast is it going in relationship to the rotation of the Earth at that location. Zero. There's no difference between the two. The aircraft and the ground are both moving along at 521 miles per hour, so their net speed in relationship to each other is zero. Now what happens if that plane takes off and goes east at 100 miles per hour? What is the speed of the aircraft? The speed of the aircraft is 521 miles per hour plus 100 miles per hour, or 621 miles per hour. So that brings its speed up to 621 miles per hour. How fast is it going over the ground? 100 miles an hour, because the Earth at this location is also going 521 miles per hour, and the difference between the two is 100 miles per hour. So, hopefully we're clear on that. 
the aircraft, wherever it is, has the rotational speed of the spot that it is over. Now, if it needs to go faster because the Earth is rotating faster, all it has to do is turn east, and it starts adding speed to its eastward vector, which is this vector right here. Now, hopefully that's kind of clear, but let me show you on this flight from Quito to New York City. So here's Quito. We're going to take off, and the runway direction has absolutely no bearing on this problem at all. We're going to take off and we're going to fly straight north to New York City. Now, what's going to happen at the end of an hour? We're going to be about here because it takes five hours and 20 minutes to get up to New York City. Where are we going to be at the end of an hour? Are we going to be here? No, that's where we want to be because that would be on our course. We're actually going to be over here because Coriolis will cause us to curve to the right. What are we going to do to fix that? Is chart a course that actually goes to the left of where we're going. And as a result, we have two vectors going again. One is the vector going north. Two is the vector going west. Now why is that western vector important? Now we know that Quito is 1,038 miles per hour in this direction, west to east, okay? Let's say right here, we're at 950 miles an hour, again, west to east. So how do we get from 1,038 miles an hour to 950 miles an hour and stay on course. Now this component right here, which goes from east to west, is opposite in direction from the 1,038 miles an hour we picked up sitting on the ground at the runway in Quito. So what's going to happen is that's going to slow this down. Now how far do we have to aim our course to the left in order to do this? Enough that that amount right there slows us from 1,038 miles an hour to 950 miles an hour. Now we're here. Let's fly another hour. Where are we going to be there? Okay, that would put us up at another hour, and we would actually be out here. So how are we going to fix that? Same way. We have to bear our course over a little bit, and again, what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to bear over enough that this east to west component of our course drops our west to east speed from 950 to 900, and we're going to end up right there instead of out here. On navigation software, what you do is you lay in a course, and that course gives you a path along the ground to follow from your departure airport to your arrival airport. Now, recall that we had broken up the flight from Quito to New York City into one hour increments. That's not the way we fly. We don't fly for an hour, figure out where we are, get back to where we're supposed to be, fly for another hour, figure out where we are, get back to where we're supposed to be. Doesn't work that way. What we do is we set a course to follow that nice magenta line all the way to our destination. Now, if we start drifting off a little bit, what do we do? We turn left and get back to the center. Now we continue to do this. Every time we drift off, we correct our course back. And this is a continuous process. But every time we have to direct our course back, we slow our west to east speed down a little bit. We trade a little bit of our south to north vector to make an east to west vector. So, Wherever we are along this course, so long as we stay on the course, what's our rotational speed in relationship to the Earth below us? 
There is no difference between the two. They are the same. We want to stay on our flight path, so we angle just slightly to the left, and that brings us straight up the flight path. So what's going to happen with Brian's around the world flight? It's going to do this the whole way. You're going to set a course between Quito and Singapore. It's going to go right over the North Pole, perhaps, and you're just going to follow that course. And as long as you are on that course, you're adjusting for Coriolis continuously as you fly, and it'll work out just fine. Again, you've got 24 hours to make that adjustment. So going from the equator at 1,038 miles an hour all the way up to the pole at zero miles an hour will involve a decrease of 1,038 miles per hour. Now the total time that it would take to do that would be 12 hours because that's the halfway point and that's 720 minutes. So 1,038 miles over 720 minutes, it's 1.44 miles per hour. So that's the equivalent with dealing with a crosswind from the west of 1.44 miles per hour. Again, that's nothing. Don't have to even think about it. So hopefully that cleared a few things up because Brian has confused an awful lot of people in the flat earth. That's the way it works. It's not a matter of debate or question. Brian is simply trying to complicate and confuse the issue to set up doubt. There is no doubt. That's what happens. It's less than one and a half mile an hour crosswind. It's nothing to deal with. I've told you that, Wolfie's told you that, every professional pilot in the world that does long distance navigation will tell you exactly the same thing because that's what's happening. So hopefully that cleared a few things up. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. And I'm glad that I was able to clear up another misconception from Brian Mullins. Take care guys. Oh, oh, oh. Bye, 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 the science guy